Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Brian Weed, I work for CHI Health, and I'm here with uh, Dr. Aaron Robinson. Dr. Robinson is a, an otolaryngologist, uh, otherwise known as an ENT physician. And uh, we're so glad to, to be with you here today, Dr. Robinson. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks. Dr. Robinson is going to talk with us today about snoring and some of the ways that we can prevent, reduce, and maybe some new ways of treating snoring. Uh, I'm super excited to hear what Dr. Robinson has to say. Uh, if you have questions in mind already about snoring, go ahead and start sending those in to us. Dr. Robinson is going to share with us some of his uh, findings and some of his new treatments. Uh, but go ahead and start sending in those questions. And then in a few moments, we will uh, get to those questions and we'll start answering them as well. Very good. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and I'll, I'll reemphasize what Brian said. Please send us questions. This discussion can be guided in whatever direction we feel is the most appropriate for the questions that you have. So um, my goal now is just to kind of give you a brief overview of what snoring is all about, um, how it happens, what ways we can treat it, um, and that can involve multiple things, including medical therapies and surgical therapies and, and uh, other things like that. So hopefully we can talk about all the things we want to get through and, sure. and answer any of the questions that you have. So first off, snoring is a symptom. It's not a disease. And that's a big mistake that people have sometimes is that they think snoring is uh, a disease that can be cured. And that's not always the case. When you have snoring, you have to think about what's causing the snoring. And so you're looking for another disease process that that might be involved in. And that's a really big list of things that can cause snoring. Um, but for me, the easiest way to think about snoring is to think about a three-story house. So on the top floor, you have your nose. And there's a lot of things that can go on in the nose that can cause snoring. And uh, the second floor is your mouth and throat. And there's a lot of things that can happen there. And then the rest of the house is your body. And so that can be your body shape, your body size, you know, your weight, um, the way your face and, and nose are formed and, and those kinds of things. And some of those you can't change. That's just the way you're born. Um, but there are some things that we can change and uh, kind of improve the way that we snore. Uh, there's kind of a basement level as well, I guess you can think of it. And that, that's maybe at the top, the attic, we'll say, the brain. <laughs> and so some of the brain things you can't control either. That's just that your brain is sometimes wired in such a way that you have sleeping problems. Um, and some of those can and can't be changed, but we'll talk about some of those different levels. Um, first, I have a little picture here. I'll see if I can get it into the right frame here. Is that okay? All right. So I like this uh, illustration. It kind of shows the three main causes of nasal obstruction. And when you have a blocked nose, that can be a big cause of snoring. The first one is the nasal septum, and so that's represented by this blue stripe here. This is cartilage that separates the nostrils into two sides. And when you have uh, a problem with the nasal septum, like a deviation, if you look over here on the left side, you can see that it's just twisted off to one side. Obviously, if there's less room to breathe through that side of the nose, then you're going to have airflow that might be turbulent and rumble around, and that's when you can get some snoring. A second cause can be these things called nasal turbinates. Um, now, turbinates, they kind of look like seashells. They have little protrusions outside of the, uh, the sidewall of the nose. And everybody has them, but sometimes they're really, really big. And that can happen from allergies, inflammation, infection. And sometimes people are just born with big turbinates. And so those can also block off your ability to breathe, especially at nights. And a lot of people have worse inflammation of their turbinates at nights because of the dust in the bedroom, uh, allergies that might be there, a whole day of breathing in uh, dirty air, and all those types of things. Um, and then lastly is the cartilage of the nose. So all this blue stuff is cartilage. And all of our noses are different. My nose is kind of messed up, looks like an Owen Wilson nose a little bit, <laughs> but it's got a lot of weak cartilage. And so I can relate to this one a lot. Um, sometimes when people breathe in with weak cartilage on the nose, the sidewall of the nose will collapse. And if the sidewall collapses, that can also cause turbulent airflow. And when you have turbulent airflow, then you get what we call snoring. And it's a really annoying thing for a lot of our loved ones, bed partners, you know, people <laughs> that, other people that live in the house. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so the nose is probably the thing that I think people think of most when they think of snoring. Sure. Um, and it, unfortunately, it's not always the cause, but that's where people seem to focus their efforts a lot. Right. Um, 
So if, if there's any questions about the nose, we can kind of start there and, and focus on some of that. Did, did you have anything? Brian? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have a couple of questions that have come in. Thank you so much for, for sending those. Um, <clears throat> question is, if you start suddenly snoring, is that a cause of concern? You haven't been snoring previously and then all of a sudden something... Well, something that's a happens. good question, you know, and it just depends on the circumstance. Sometimes we'll start snoring and we will be developing a cold of some sort or mm. we have some inflammation in our nose. Maybe it's the time of the year where you have the most susceptibility to allergies. And so maybe, mm. you know, during the harvest season when there's a lot of dust, you know, right. all around, maybe that's, that triggers you to have swelling in your nose and you start to snore. Sure. Um, in general, it's not something that you need to run to the hospital for, okay. but it's, a, it's something that you need to look at your life and think, well, what's changed? Something is different around me right. that has made my nose get more swollen or, or something else. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Good question. Yeah. Uh, another question about uh, strips. You know, we hear about mm -hmm. like breathe right strips and those kinds of things that I think they're supposed to go over your nose and hold the nostrils open. Yeah. Uh, do those do those help at all with snoring? They do, um, and that's a great um, non-surgical device that you can try. And so what those do is they address the cartilage. We talked about how it can be weak, and it pulls the sides of the nose open just to kind of stretch mm -hmm. open the nostrils. Mm -hmm. And they work well, but they, you know, just like anything, they have pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. so they don't stick always very well. Right. And sometimes you're rolling around at night and they come off. Um, sometimes you can be allergic to the adhesive and, and it's a temporary solution. So it really only help you if you wore it and not everybody wants to wear that throughout the day. Right. Cause some people who have obstruction from a collapsing nose are going to have obstruction throughout the day. Just not just at night. True. It may be more noticeable at night cause that's when you snore, <laughs> but throughout the day you might have that. So. There's actually a new device that we have that um, we can do an implantable breathe right strip. And it sounds, sure. uh, it sounds a little scary, but it's really not. We can use a small a, a catheter to inject it underneath the skin up into the sidewall of the nose. I have, I have a little picture, see if we can get it in the frame. Yeah, show, you can see show what that it looks to us. Like. <laughs> so this right here, this uh, white device here is the implantable breathe right strip. It's called Latera. Um, and what it is, is it's made of suture material. So it eventually will dissolve. It takes about a year and a half. But again, we can inject this underneath the skin of the nose, kind of just right under the nostril here. So it's very small. But one on each side, very, very small, smaller than an earbud that you'd put in your ear. Mm -hmm. And you don't see it. It doesn't change the shape of the nose at all. Sure. Um, there's minimal recovery. You can do this in the office. I mean, there's a lot of great things about it. That's exciting to yeah. hear about. Yeah. And it really helps. It stiffens the, the sides of the nose just enough that when people breathe in, mm -hmm. they don't have collapse and it can really prevent snoring in a lot of ways. It's very interesting to, to know that that's yeah. uh, an option. Uh, we have another question here about neti pots and nasal rinses and those kinds of things. Well, yeah. What's, what are those all about? I love nasal rinses. I, I do not have any stock in the nasal rinse <laughs> company or anything like that, but I love them. I think they work great. Um, I think out of all of the non-surgical options mm -hmm. and, and therapies, it's probably the best because there's no medication involved, so there's really no side effects. It can be a little bit uh, annoying for people to use, right? Right. <laughs> it can be a challenge. It sometimes is a little awkward to get the water up there, but it really works because mm -hmm. it washes out all the allergy particles that you might have breathed in. It washes out excess, excess mucus. It can really open up the nose. Uh, it's not a cure for anatomical obstructions, mm -hmm. like a deviated septum or okay. big turbinates, but sure. it can help reduce the amount of inflammation. Okay. And, you know, Things like nasal sprays can also do that. Um, right. But sometimes you reach a point where th there's not a lot more you can do. Some mm -hmm. people have been on sprays for years and years and years, and they still continue to have nasal mm -hmm. obstruction. They still continue to have nasal swelling. And so... Sure. Yeah. Now, tell us about the sprays. That's, that's another question we yeah. had, um, like Flonase and those kinds yeah, of sprays. So, what are those all about? So Flonase and all the steroid sprays, the Nasonex, mm -hmm. I mean, you can go on and on with uh -huh. the list of those. Right. They're all nasal steroids, and what they do is they react... They're a topical spray, so you spray it in your nose, it coats the lining of the nose, most of the turbinates, mm -hmm. those are the things that swell, and it causes them to be less inflammatory, so they don't get okay. as big. Um, there's another subset of sprays called antihistamine sprays, and some of those will also kind of combat the allergy part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those, sometimes we can combine those sprays, and so you get the allergy part with the antihistamine, mm -hmm. you get the anti-inflammatory with the... Mm -hmm. um, steroid spray okay but and sometimes it works great and so that's always my preference is to treat sure. somebody with the most minimally invasive way possible right it's better for the patient and you know it makes them feel better there's no risk um, sometimes that doesn't work though and so in that in that case sometimes we can go in and we can do surgical things and so one thing we can do is we can shrink the turbinates physically 
with uh, electro cautery and kind of shrink them down. That works well. Um, there's a newer device that's come out, and instead of using heat, we actually use cold. Oh, interesting. It's called cryotherapy. Okay. So let me see if I can get this picture in here just so you can kind of get an idea what it looks like. This is called the Clarifix. It's basically a canister of compressed gas, uh, like CO2, carbon dioxide, and we can put a little probe into the nose right back at the very back where the turbinates are, and underneath the skin here, you can't see it, but there's a little nerve called the vidian nerve, and that supplies these turbinates. And what that nerve does is it makes them get swollen so that we can protect ourselves against things that we might breathe in through our nose, allergy particles, etc. So what this device does is we put a little pad there mm -hmm. and it shoots this cold gas in there, kind of like if you were using one of those aerosol canisters to clean out your keyboard, you know how cold that can get? It's very similar. It freezes the nerve and it causes it to basically get paralyzed in a way so mm -hmm. that it doesn't cause swelling in your nose anymore. Um, it's a great device. It's, it's done in the office. It takes mm -hmm. about a minute once you're numbed up. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest side effect is sometimes people have like an ice cream type headache for 24 hours and okay. then it kind of goes away. But over two or three weeks, as this starts to work and the nerve starts to kind of back off on mm -hmm. how much inflammation it's giving you, those turbinates will shrink down almost like you're using a nasal spray every day okay. without having to use that. And it really opens up the nose, takes away nasal drip and all that kind of stuff. So, so by reducing the inflammation with that, that cold on the nerves, it reduces the mucus production, it reduces the uh, inflammation so that things can drain properly. Yeah, that absolutely. Basically. So the inflammation is twofold. You have the swelling of the turbinates, and so that just blocks off your airflow. Sure. And when the turbinates get swollen, they leak mucus. That's a protective mechanism, okay? But sometimes people have way too much mucus. Right. And so the body's working overtime for no reason. Even if we freeze these nerves, you're still gonna have plenty of mucus in the nose. Mm -hmm. This is for people that have tried sprays, they still have obstruction, they still have drainage, mm -hmm. and they're just over-producers of mucus. They're over-producers of inflammation. Sure. And it, and it works great, and it's, like I said, minimally invasive, safe, easy to do in the office. Uh, it's a great option for people that don't wanna have surgery, and who are just not responsive to nasal sprays. Right. So, and it's cool, it's, it's very kind of cutting edge and elegant, which yeah. is also really neat, too. It's really so, small, but. Very small, that, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> that device looks very small in, in your nose. Yeah. A couple more questions that have come in. Yeah. Um, you know, I know for me personally, when I'm on my back sleeping, I know that I snore a lot more than on my side or my stomach. Yeah. Ellie asks if uh, you snore while lying on your side or your stomach, is that more of a physical issue rather than so a So if you snore more issue? on your side right. or your stomach? Or e even if you still snore while yeah. on your side. So that's a good question. and. and Part of the answer to that is we'd have to see how you're sleeping. And it, you know, you don't ever want to have anybody watch you sleep. It's a little bit creepy. Right. But there is something called a sleep study. And mm -hmm. that's really important to, as part of a workup of snoring to get a sleep study. And what a sleep study is, there's multiple ways to do this. It can be done in a sleep center where you're actually in a bed that's not your own and people are watching you at the camera and they have lots of wires and things to check how you're sleeping, check your brain waves, check how much snoring you have. Uh, and then there's an in-home version of that where you put the wires on yourself and you sleep and you turn in the device and they look at the data. Um, so doing a sleep study really helps to determine what the snoring might be related to. If it is related to something like sleep apnea, then that might be a case where you look at CPAP, which is a machine that helps blow mm -hmm. air into your mouth to help mm -hmm. you from snoring. And that's not always the answer, but it is mm -hmm. part of a snoring workup is to know if you have sleep apnea or not. Because that can be life-threatening. Right. right? right. But if it's not sleep apnea, you also get good data from those sleep studies where it can look and they can tell you when you're on your back, you have a lot more times where you pause breathing and snore. When you're on your side, it's a lot less. And so they have the capabilities right. to show you that. Um, yeah. And we didn't talk about the mouth, but we'll talk a little bit about that because that kind of addresses this question. It does, yeah, um, for sure. In the mouth, um, we have a lot of structures. The teeth, the tongue, the tonsils on either side, and then here's this thing that hangs down called the uvula. Um, if people have really big tonsils, that can cause a lot of snoring. Obviously, they're, they're big, they're blocking off airflow. The uvula, if it's extra long, it'll go down behind the tongue. It'll flop in the back of the throat and cause some snoring. The tongue sometimes can be extra large. In the back sometimes, we have these little tonsils in the back of the tongue called lingual tonsils. And if those are big, they can also cause some blockage when you, when you breathe in and out. The palate, the soft palate, if it's floppy, sometimes that'll cause you to snore. And the main reason it causes you to snore is because when we relax, 
our body's job is to get us rest. And so when we lay down, we fall asleep, our body gets paralyzed in a way so that we can relax, so we can rejuvenate ourselves. Part of that paralysis includes all the muscles in our throat. And so if you have big tonsils, they flop back into your throat. Right. If you have a long uvula <laughs> or, a, or a soft pellet that's kind of floppy, it'll flop back there. Um, and the tongue as well. And so treating that is something that sometimes has to be done with surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and so for the mouth stuff, there, there are several things that have been looked at and tried over the years. You know, in the past, maybe even just 10 years ago, we used to take out a lot of tonsils and trim mm -hmm. a lot of people's uvulas, just as a, a matter of fact, if people had snoring. But we found that it doesn't always work. And our goal, my goal, especially as a physician, is to try and find the most uh, minimally invasive, safe treatment for my patient with the most benefit, okay? And so that surgery was kind of a high risk, high recovery, lots of pain surgery right. with some benefit. So we're looking sure, at things that are sure. moving that curve around a little bit. So, sure. you know, sometimes taking out the tonsils is the right thing to do. If they're huge, it's the right thing to do. If the uvula is really long, mm -hmm. it's the right thing to do. There are some implants we can put into the palate called pillar implants. They're uh, suture material. You can inject them into the palate and stiffen it up that way. So that's a surgical option. Sometimes the tongue can be shrunken down with a little bit of uh, electric uh, energy. It'll kind of hmm. shrink the tongue a little bit. Um, and the most minimally invasive and honestly probably the most effective at this point is something called an oral appliance where we can make an impression of your gums. I work with some mm. dentists that will help make these appliances and it'll move your jaw into a position that it brings your jaw forward and pulls the, the tongue and the, all the tissue mm -hmm. back there that flops back forward while you sleep. And those can be adjusted. So say you put it in, you know, on one setting, you're still having snoring, you can adjust it so your jaw comes mm. even more forward and then you don't snore. And, so, and would that keep your mouth closed while you're, you're breathing and yeah. sleeping so you'd be breathing out of your nose? Yeah, well, or, well you can still breathe through okay. your mouth, but it, it does have an upper and a lower component okay. that kind of fit onto your teeth, just like a sports mm -hmm. uh, guard, tooth guard, it's a sure. lot like that. You make a, a custom mold for that. Okay. You know, obviously some of these things are, they do have a cost involved, not all of them are covered by insurance, right. but it's a really great non-surgical option that can sure. work for people with problems in the throat area. Something to consider for yeah. sure. Uh, another uh, couple more questions that have come in. Please continue uh, sending us your questions. We still have a few more minutes to take them. Uh, Jackie, thank you for submitting your question, Jackie. She wants to know about uh, deviated septum. So mm -hmm. a lot of us have deviated septums. We've been told we know that we have that. Um, is there any remedy for that other than surgery? And is it really important to get repaired? That's a great question. <clears throat> now, you have to think of it as a blockage. So if you have a septum that's straight, you're gonna have unimpeded air throw, airflow through your nose, okay? But nobody has a completely straight septum. I would say, I would venture to say that 100% of people have a little bit of deviation. Mm -hmm. Sure. Now whether that's significant or not really depends on the patient, okay? I myself have a deviated septum. Fortunately, it doesn't really cause me any problems. And by problems, I mean I don't feel like my nose is obstructed, I don't feel like I have trouble mm -hmm. sleeping at night. I, I snore a bit, my wife says, but not, uh, and not uh, that it wakes up the house, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me, I don't feel like I need to get my septum fixed. But for somebody who has symptomatic deviated septum, so they're having nasal obstruction, they're having snoring, they're having difficulty breathing, there's not a lot that can be done aside from surgery because it's a, yep. it's a physical blockage that right. has to be removed. Now, you can look at other things like we talked about, the turbinate bones, if those can be shrunken down or if they could be used, a cryotherapy wand could be used to shrink them. Um, the sidewall of the nose needs to be evaluated. And so I've had a lot of patients who have had a minorly deviated septum, mm -hmm. but big turbinates and collapsing sidewalls. And I have not done septoplasties on them. Mm -hmm. I've done the, the Latera implant. I've done the shrinking of the turbinates mm -hmm. and I've avoided the septum surgery, which mm -hmm. is a little bit more involved, more sure. recovery. And they have done fantastically because their main problem wasn't the septum. It was the blockage from the swelling it was right. the blockage from the collapsing of the nose. A little bit of a combination and so, of maybe some of those yeah. different issues. And so it's important if you feel sure. like you have a deviated septum that might be causing you problems to visit with an mm -hmm. ENT, sit down, have them do a full exam of your nose and really give you the, the rundown of what can be fixed and what sure. the potential Im improvements might be. So it's a great question. Very yeah. good. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> let's see, Janine. Thank you for submitting your question, Janine. Uh, she asks, what app do you suggest to monitor snoring and movement? Is there an app that you can use on your phone? There are a lot of apps. I wish I could tell you one to use. Um, <laughs> but my, my advice to you would be get on the app store, 
look for the free ones, download three or four of them and see which one works best for you because okay. I think it's gonna depend on the person. Sure. What kind of interface you enjoy, what kind of uh, data you wanna get from that. But I am fully in support of mm -hmm. the snoring apps and sure. the sleeping apps that are on phones. That's the cool thing, you know, 20 years ago we didn't even know what a smartphone was and now we have all this technology in our hands and we can put it on our bedside and you can almost do a sleep study on yourself. Almost, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I fully support those apps. Look them up, cool. find one that works for you, and I think it's great data. And bring it to your ENT. If you come to see an ENT mm. for snoring, bring the data in. Sometimes it'll record your snoring, so it's nice to hear what it sounds like. It gives you an idea where it's coming from. It'll kind of give us an idea sure. of what to look for, and so very helpful. Excellent. Are there uh, any thyroid issues that can cause snoring? A... Um, you know, thyroid is a really interesting topic. Uh, and it can involve so many things. In general, the thyroid regulates your metabolism. And so if you have a, meta a metabolism that's out of whack, absolutely, you can have some strange things happen. That might involve snoring and a bunch of other things. Um, sometimes if somebody has a really big thyroid goiter that's mm -hmm. pushing on their airway, mm -hmm. that could be a potential cause of snoring, but that would be very noticeable. Yeah. You, you'd have a big thing hanging out of your neck. Right. Um, but probably the most common thing with thyroid is weight gain. And so if somebody has an underactive thyroid, and they gain weight, mm -hmm. and th this is not just for thyroid, but weight gain in general is probably, out of all the things we talked about, the mm -hmm. number one cause of snoring. Gotcha. And so, so for somebody who's overweight, um, it's probably the hardest thing to fix because it takes time and mm -hmm. consistency and effort, but if you can lose weight, you're probably gonna get your snoring to go away. And so I work with uh, weight loss experts uh, in kind of a multidisciplinary fashion with the dentist mm -hmm. and myself and the weight loss, and we really try and focus on the best way to help people, and a lot of that is weight loss. And so some of that right. is mostly medical weight loss, so people are focusing on what they eat, doing certain diets, maybe taking certain diet pills based mm -hmm. on what your doctor asks you to do. Sure. And then if that doesn't work, then there is the option for surgical weight loss. But that's a huge topic in snoring right. is, is, is weight. So as far as thyroid goes, that's probably the most important thing. Good to know. Uh, Sonia asks, thank you for submitting Sonia. She asks if she should be concerned that her 10-year-old snores. So pediatric snoring is a really important topic. I'm really glad you brought that up. I, I, we didn't have that on our list to talk about, but I think this is a really important topic. Um, in kids, the most common form of snoring is from the tonsils. Mm -hmm. And so in a kid who snores loudly, and adenoids, I guess I should add. So tonsils, which are the, the little lymphoid tissues in the back of the throat, and then the adenoids, which are tonsils right behind the back of the nose. If those are enlarged in a kid, they will cause snoring. And if they're causing snoring, and sometimes it'll cause what we call apnea, where the kid will mm. stop breathing and then gasp for breath in the middle of the night. Um, those are all signs of sleep apnea or pre-apnea in a kid. And it's something that has to be taken care of. Um, sleep apnea over time can cause strain on your heart. It can cause you to have different problems with blood pressure and things like that. And mm -hmm. so the most common reason for kids to get their tonsils out in the United States is actually sleep apnea. Large tonsils as, as the main culprit, mm -hmm. large tonsils and adenoids. And so if you have a child who's 10 year old that snores, it probably has to do with their tonsils and adenoids, and so I'd encourage you to get those looked at. Excellent. Yeah. Very good. Uh, if I'm a snorer, how can I stop? <laughs> There's a lot of a lot of things we've talked about here today. Yeah. <laughs> so you know that that's kind of the overall question, right. right? That's the golden ticket. That is. So if I could figure that out, I'd retire right now. <laughs> No, there's a lot of answers to that. Yeah. And so that's why we're kind of talking about this in a, in a stepwise fashion. And like I said, I have a mm -hmm. multidisciplinary team that we work together. Um, it, it takes a thorough evaluation by somebody who is comfortable with the different options for snoring. Right. And so if, if you go to a doctor at an ENT and they evaluate your, your nose and throat and everything else for snoring, then they're probably going to find something that they can work on. Whether that be in the nose, working you know, like we talked about with sprays or mm -hmm. other surgical mm -hmm. or medical devices, um, the mouth, looking at the tonsils, the palate, and the teeth, making sure that they're in the right place so that your tongue doesn't flop in the back of your throat. Looking at weight loss, you know, mm -hmm. looking at other factors like uh, sleep apnea, you know, doing a sleep study, making sure that's not it. Um, it also, you know, sleep apnea tests also look at the brain function and they tell us that the brain is making us snore too much. Um, some of the easy things that you can do right now at home is avoid drinking alcohol at nights. Mm -hmm. Alcohol is a major cause of snoring because it puts you into a deeper sleep where your body's more right. relaxed so you have more floppiness. Um, don't be a male because males are 70% <laughs> more likely to snore than a female. So so there's some science to that that, yeah. that we always hear like, you know, yeah. guys tend to snore. So that's and it's true. true. All the data points that if you're male, 
and, and you're overweight and you drink alcohol, <laughs> you're going to snore. And that encompasses a lot of Nebraskans, especially right. on game day. So. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing we can do about it, right? Yeah. It's just the way it is. Well, that's good to know, I guess. Um, what signs might point to needing a CPAP machine? Is CPAP just for snoring? It's more for apnea. Yeah, that's a great These question. These are all kind of tied together in yeah, some way, Yeah, that's right? a great question. So CPAP is not for snoring. CPAP is for sleep apnea. And as we said in the beginning, snoring is a symptom. And it is a major symptom of sleep apnea. Sure. It's kind of an indicator like, hey, something's not right with you. You're not breathing as well as you should be at night. Right. And so, yeah, CPAP um, is not for snoring, but it will make your snoring better. Okay. Because it takes away that uh, sleep uh, issue where the throat is collapsing mm -hmm. or the nose is collapsing. Because what CPAP does is it actually pushes air into your nose and mouth right. to open up everything. It's called positive pressure. And by opening up the throat and helping you breathe better, you sleep deeper, you sleep mm -hmm. better, you feel more refreshed, and you don't snore. Sure. And I would say, I have, a not, I have not yet met a bed partner who prefers snoring over the sound of the CPAP machine. <laughs> Most bed partners are extremely happy with the sound of a CPAP machine okay. over snoring. That's so. a great segue into our next question, which has come in. Um, I'm losing sleep because of snoring. Uh, my partner's snoring is concerning. Um, how can I help maybe get better sleep if my partner is snoring? So, um, this is a loaded question. <laughs> The easiest thing to Careful. do is get earplugs, right? Yeah. Right, right. But that's not always going to help. Sometimes you can hear it through the earplugs. But from you know from your standpoint, that's something to think about. Um, but just getting your bed partner to go see somebody. Sure. That's the biggest step. I hear this all the time, men especially because we're brutes and we, we mm -hmm. have we're hard headed. They come in, they say, I wouldn't be here except my wife said right. if I don't come in, she's going to kick me out of the house. Right. <laughs> and so I spend a lot of time talking to these guys about their snoring at the behest of their wife, who often comes with and tells me <laughs> about how bad it is. Um, so just getting somebody to come in and get evaluated for it is the first step. Sure. Because there probably is something that can be improved. Um, one thing we didn't talk about uh, as far as non-surgical therapies is, is uh, back sleeping. You had mentioned that sleeping oh, yeah. on your back mm -hmm. sometimes. We talked about side sleeping, but mm -hmm. you know, sleeping on your back is an easy way to snore because yeah. if you think about it, gravity is pulling everything back to the back of your throat, and then when you breathe in, it's flopping. Right. And so si sleeping on your side sometimes can fix a lot of snoring. Now, sure. that's not always the case, but it's another thing you can try at home right now that's easy to do. Sure. Um, With yeah. a pillow behind. Yeah, you put a pillow behind there. Some people, uh, and I've, I've recommended this many times, you sew a tennis ball to the back of the shirt. And I've so heard that, yeah. When you, <laughs> when you lay over, there's a tennis ball, so right. you don't want to lay on your back anymore. <laughs> Side sleeping pillows are another thing. Sure. Okay. Something else to try for sure. Uh, we just have a couple more questions that uh, we would like to, uh, to go through. Morgan, thank you for asking, wants to know if using tobacco products can make symptoms worse, like we talked about alcohol, tobacco. Would that Absolutely. be uh, something? So smoking is never a good idea. It causes so many other problems, but in the guise of snoring, absolutely. And the biggest reason it causes problems with snoring is that it causes inflammation. So in the nose and in the throat, that's where a lot of that smoke, when you inhale that stuff, it goes mm -hmm. into your nasal cavity and it touches all those mucous membranes and it causes them to be inflamed. Sure. So that's a big part of it. And we talked about how inflammation in the nose can cause turbulent right. airflow. Secondly, it's gonna mess with your lungs. And so if your lungs are getting inflamed, if they're getting mucus mm -hmm. buildup in them, then you're gonna have a harder time breathing. If you're trying to suck air in even harder because your lungs don't work well, you're gonna have more turbulent airflow through your nose and that's, sure. that makes snoring. Sure, yeah. makes sense. Yep. Uh, I think one final question here. Want to, this person wants to know if I can make an appointment without a referral. Can I just come see you? So that really is dependent on your insurance. Okay. But in general, if you call our office, we can guide you through that whole process. Sure. Um, and for most people, yeah, you can come see us without a referral, and, and we'd be happy to see you anytime. We, we pride Excellent. ourselves on trying to get as many people in as we can and help people and not make them wait too long because sure. we know that these things are very altering to your life and lifestyle, and especially sometimes your bed partner's lifestyle. Right, so, right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, with that, I will uh, go ahead and I'll give you the information that you can call okay. the office if you want to come see Dr. Robinson or... Uh, one of his wonderful partners, Dr. Tech, Dr. Tesmer, here at ENT Nebraska. Uh, their phone number is 402-484-5500. And uh, I hear that you go to Crete and Aurora, you're, uh, you or one of your partners, every other week. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So you're here in Lincoln every day, uh, five days a week. And then also you go to Crete and Aurora uh, every other week. So if that's more convenient for you, you can visit them there. And then we also have a group in Omaha. We have an ENT group there, uh, the CHI Health Clinic ENT. 
They are at Emanuel, they're at uh, Creighton University Medical Center, Bergen Mercy, as well as Lakeside. You can visit with Dr. Please or Dr. Ogren there. If you want to see them, they're 402-758-5600. And so I would uh, encourage you to visit with one of our ENT physicians, um, whether it's here in Lincoln or uh, in Omaha or Aurora, Crete. Give us a call and uh, come see us. Thank you so much for joining us today. And Dr. Robinson, thank you so Thanks. much for all the information that yeah. you've shared with us. Really appreciate it. Was it was a lot of fun. Hopefully it helped. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay.